What is going on everyone? Welcome to another very exciting episode right here on the MI Gardener channel. I am so excited for today's video because we're going to be starting every single seed that we're going to be growing in the 2020 gardening season. Everything except for the stuff that we would normally direct sow outside. Those we're still going to direct sow. However, anything that we would normally start inside, plus a few exceptions that we'll also talk about, we're going to be starting inside. And that's because we're in a race against time. Um, a lot of you have messaged me in recent days and said, Luke, I'm very worried about uh, our, our food system, food shortages. Can you weigh in on, on that? Can I give your opinion? And if this is any indication, the fact that we're starting everything all at once, even some stuff we're starting extremely early, earlier than we would normally, all at once, if it's any indication, I am concerned as well. And I'll get into why before we start these, before we start these seeds. It is very uh, concerning to me when you have uh, rushes. Anytime you have a rush, this is called supply chain shock. It's something that we studied extensively on and it's very, very important to look at. It's not the here and now that I'm worried about. And what concerns me and frustrates me is all of these economists and all these people on the talking box, the TV, they tell you, don't worry, everything's gonna be fine. We're all gonna be fine. And I say, no one is bringing up the supply chain shock for two or three months. What is the ramifications of what we are doing right now that is going to affect the future? This food takes you know, one to four months to mature. So two or three months down the road, we are going to experience what's called supply chain shock. All of the crops you see right now when you grab lettuce off the shelf, uh, that lettuce is replenished and it's, and it's put back. However, if everybody does it all at once, the farmers have to harvest more. And how you know that there is a, a supply chain shock is you look at the quality of the produce. This is very, very telling. If you start to get produce that is getting smaller in size, heads of lettuce are getting smaller. Um, tomatoes are coming to the grocery store greener and greener. Um, I don't really like to eat uh, tomatoes from the grocery store, but it's very telling. Um, if they have less time to get them ideal before they're putting them on the shelves, uh, you can kind of tell that there's a panic on the back end. Um, if strawberries are uh, less ripe than they would normally be, or bananas, if they're very, very green compared to how they normally are, those trends show you a panic on the back end where farmers are trying to catch up to that, uh, to that, that shock. The problem is, is that things don't mature immediately. So they're pulling off crops prematurely. They're obviously, hopefully starting stuff for the future, but those crops won't be ready to, uh, to be harvested for you know, quite some time until they're ready. So it's not the here and now that I'm worried about because there are some sacrifices that can be made with quality or size, uh, things like that. But once things get to a point where the, uh, the supply chain shock does not allow for the, the existing supply chain to catch up, that's where you have your shortages. I see way too many people talking about the here and now. You know, you can go to the grocery store tomorrow and get eggs and milk. However, um, you know, if there continues to be this supply chain shock, um, you're going to have an issue there where uh, there, there needs to be what's called a turnover rate. And that turnover rate is, is basically the time that it takes to get something to, uh, to market. And so for something like eggs and milk, I'm not as concerned because there will always be cows that are ready to give milk. And they kind of have a set, uh, they kind of have a, a set supply. Um, and so, uh, you would see more shortages right now than you probably would in the future of, of milk. Same thing with eggs. Chickens lay eggs all the time. Um, a mature chicken will lay eggs for, you know, for, for quite a while. Um, but when it comes to something that is mature and then is perishable after it matures, something like lettuce or strawberries, beans, any of your, uh, produce, those are the things that are very susceptible to supply chain shock. And so um, that's why I'm starting all my stuff right now. Because having studied economics and having studied supply chain shock, um, I do know the ramifications. And I can tell you that uh, what they're not telling you is two or three months down the road, we are going to have some very, uh, some very severe shortages or increase in prices. Because either way, if you have the same supply but increased demand, they're going to raise prices. That's how it works. That's how they kind of keep those things in check. So let's first talk about the, uh, I'll talk, leave seeds for last. I'll talk about our seed starting setup. This looks a little bit different than normal because normally we start in uh, like plug trays. I don't have any plug trays around here, unfortunately. Um, 
Yeah, I don't have any plug trays around, but they are a 288 cell tray. They're about, uh, they're about three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch. And that's how big the cells are. Very, very, very small cells. But it allows me to start a ton of plants in a small amount of space. However, you don't see those uh, here on this table and that's because I'm doing away with them. What I'm doing is because I'm starting a lot of stuff very early, I'm going to need a little bit more space for them to grow and mature. And that way I'm not up potting and up potting and up potting, it's less maintenance. So I'm starting directly in a uh, two inch by two inch cell here. And so much, much less uh, cell space, but a lot more growable area. Then I also have these. These are, uh, these are um, just uh, flats. These are known as, uh, these are known as 1020 trays. So these 1020 trays are going to give you the rigidity to be able to carry the plants around without them you know, breaking and stuff like that. So these just sit right in here, just like that. But they also have holes in the bottom. And so because they have holes in the bottom, I also have, because I don't wanna ruin my floor with a bunch of water running all over the place, I also am going to combine that with a holeless flood pan. This will do a couple things. One is this will allow for very good root development because the water is going to drain through, but it's going to get stored in this. This is going to basically be a water reservoir that will allow me to put this tray in here like this. This water reservoir will hold the water. It will allow the, the water to drain through the, the, the um, cell packs here. So it's not going to flood the roots and it will basically tell the roots to go downward. And when it goes down, when the roots go downward, they're looking for water, that's their job. And they're gonna tap into that water storage down below and it's gonna to lead to very good root development. So this is what I'm doing to basically ensure that my plants are gonna be as stress-free as possible. So that those three things are my system for this year. Definitely not my normal system, definitely not what I would regularly recommend doing, but when uh, time is of the essence and I'm starting things like uh, you know, um, like lettuce, for instance, I would never start lettuce right now. Just no way. Why would I start lettuce right now? You know, I have, I have probably four or six more weeks until I can plant outside. And so I would never plant lettuce right now, except for I'm planting it right now because I want fully mature plants, uh, or near fully mature plants that I can move outside so that they can continue growing and finish growing outside, uh, when I need them to put on my family's table. Um, so, and I do plan on also succession planting where I'm not gonna sow every single seed inside. I might sow half the seeds inside and then when I plant these outside, I'll also plant some seeds right in the ground. And that way I have a staggered succession where I also don't have supply chain shock, where I, uh, where I have a huge harvest I don't have anything to do with it all, and then I harvest it, and then I still have a shortage. So I'm going to kind of stagger my harvest throughout the season by uh, succession planting. We'll have more videos on that as well. All right, so this is the soil mixture. Now it's a little bit different from our normal soil mixture, so I'm gonna go through this in, uh, in some detail here because I really, really love how this came out. Now, the reason why this is different is because we have to not only start seeds, but we also have to, to grow plants. Normally with a seed starting mix, I don't have to take as much care because I'm starting seeds. Um, all of your seeds, no matter what you're starting, have nutrients within the seed that allow them to grow for about one or two weeks without showing any signs of nutrient deficiencies at all. And so for one or two weeks, you really don't need any nutrients. After three weeks, you need to start supplementing with some nutrients to continue growing and continue feeding the plant. So uh, since we're starting so early, I can't just grow the seedlings. I also have to grow the plants. And so I needed some nutrients in here as well. Now a seed starting mix is usually a very fine, soft mix that's gonna be well draining, holds on to air really well though, and uh, it's just a very porous, very, very fine mix to allow for fine root development because that's what seedlings have. However, as they mature more and as they get you know bigger root systems and the plant starts growing, it not only needs more nutrients, but it also needs to, uh, it needs to be able to grow throughout the mix and be encouraged to grow throughout the medium. So what I did was I double sifted my mix. I took a regular bag of Pro Mix and I sifted it down uh, with a half inch mesh. Uh, all, of the, uh, all of the larger than half inch size material, I threw that in my compost pile. Anything else that sifted through, that's what I'm using. So I'm left with a very fine mix that still does have some, some 
chunky stuff, but nothing really big. Then what I did was I added a little bit of Trifecta Plus for some nutrients. I also added some worm castings for some, uh, some additional kind of uh, soil building benefits. Um, and then the final thing that I added was some uh, lighter, um, some smaller grade perlite and vermiculite. I added just some very, uh, very fine perlite and vermiculite into this so that it increases the water holding capabilities as well as the aeration and drainage. All right, so I got a ton of seeds to go through here. We're not gonna have time in this video as I'm realizing, um, checking the timestamp on the, on the video. We're not gonna have time to start all of our seeds in this video. That'll be for another video, but that's okay. We have lots of time, don't we? <laughs> Nothing but time while we're all at home. So uh, I'm going to, for time's sake, I'm just gonna go through all the things that we're gonna be starting. And then in the next video, we're gonna talk about starting seeds. We're gonna talk about um, you know seed uh, spacing when seed starting, uh, seed depth, and how important that is when seed starting. We're gonna talk about some other things with um, mistakes I see people making when it comes to uh, different seeds and uh, their, where they are in the soil column. You know, if they need to be planted shallow, medium, or deep to have good results. Um, so we'll go through some of those things as well in, uh, in the next video. But I wanted to go through just all the seeds that we're starting because that way you can kind of get a, give an or that way you can kind of get an idea of everything that I'm starting. So we're gonna be starting obviously uh, some lettuce. We're gonna be starting some prize head leaf lettuce, some super red romaine. We're gonna be starting some uh, bronze guard leaf lettuce. Uh, what else here? Um, some arugula, some tango leaf lettuce. Now again, we're gonna be starting some of our plants and then we're also gonna be starting some seeds outside as a succession. So not everything is gonna get started, but we're gonna start all of those. We're gonna start some herbs like cilantro, um, our basils, we got uh, a piccolino basil or pluto basil, Italian large leaf basil, Thai basil, a, a, new, uh, a new variety of cilantro, new to MI Gardener, called calypso basil. This is actually the type of, uh, or calypso cilantro, sorry. This is the type of cilantro that's grown for market. It's very fragrant, it has a very long shelf life, very slow to bolt, and uh, really excited to be growing this one this year. We also gonna be starting some onions. We got red burgundy onions, the uh, ruby red onion. What else here? Got some uh, white sweet Spanish, you know, our usual onions, nothing really new there. Elsa Craig onions, uh, some Cipollini onion. We're also gonna be starting some spinaches. I have. Bloomsdale Longstanding Spinach, American Spinach, and Viraflay Spinach. I'm mixing up my spinaches this year because uh, a lot of spinaches are um, they're very early season. However, what I went out and find what I went out and found were uh, early, mid, and late season spinaches. This is kind of dictates how long they will uh, grow before they go to seed. American spinach is a very late season spinach, very heat tolerant. So that's a late season spinach. Your Bloomsdale Long Standing is an early spinach. It has to be started very early. It will go to seed very quickly. I'm starting them all at the same time, but uh, the Bloomsdale Long Standing will harvest first and then move into the other spinaches as they uh, mature. So that's an early spinach. And then the Viraflay is a mid-season spinach. This one is gonna be about 45 to 55 days to maturity. And that way uh, we're gonna have something kind of all along the way that we can be harvesting. We have Peas, this is a spring blush pea, new to MI Gardener, very, very cool. Some beans, Oriental Yard Long Bean, Blue Lake Pole Bean, Blue Lake Bush Bean, uh, Kentucky Wonder Pole Bean. We got peppers, uh, banana peppers, ancho grand peppers, <laughs> pasilla bahio peppers. Uh, what else here? Some more beans, top crop beans. Uh, some more lettuce, Lola Rosa lettuce. We have kale. We have uh, the feathered frills kale. Very, very cool. Oh, you can't see it, of course. It's so, it's so bright. <laughs> um, go check it out on, uh, online. It's very, very cool. Feathered frills kale, scarlet kale. All the seeds also are coming from migardener.com. Every single seed is gonna be started from MI Gardener seed. So uh, very, very cool. Uh, Rainbow Swiss chard, top crop beans, red acre cabbage. Got tons of tomatoes this year, um, but we also have some Tokyo long bunching onions. Cannot forget those. We're gonna start some inside and some directly outside because those are very much like lettuce. We're talking like 45 to 50 days to learn mature, so um, you can do that. 
We have, uh, like I said, lots of tomatoes. We have tons of tomatoes, but that's because tomatoes are our favorite crop to grow. They're very easy to grow. And um, if you grow them high intensity, you can grow a lot in a small amount of space. So I think there's probably some more in there, but uh, old German tomato, a great indeterminate tomato, uh, bicolored yellow, red tomato, beautiful. Ace 55 tomato. This is a determinant. We're gonna grow this in containers, not in our raised beds. Um, this is going to be more of like your bushing style tomato, very early to mature. So again, kind of uh, important for our food security to have some early tomatoes. Quadro, an indeterminate, very beautiful paste style salsa tomato. Opalka, wonderful paste tomato, uh, indeterminate, and uh, one of our favorites. Tropical sunset tomato, new to MI Gardener, absolutely stunning in every way. Uh, this is a bicolored cherry tomato, and um, it just has these incredible, almost uh, star explosions of, of orange and pink. Looks just beautiful. Um, looks like a sunset. <laughs> um, big rainbow tomato. Pineapple tomato, um, all those are uh, bicolored. We have a lot of bicolored this year. Uh, Big Rainbow is a yellow red bicolored beef steak. We have pineapple, which is a yellow red bicolored beef steak, also indeterminate. One of Mrs. Emma Gardner's favorite tomatoes. Extremely sweet, very fruity. We have uh, another new one for the store. It's Gilberti. This is a, uh, another paste tomato. It's indeterminate, extremely rare to find, and um, it's a cross between an opalka and a Jersey Devil. Very beautiful, very, very cool. Rutgers tomato, this is a determinant, also going in containers. Um, so we're gonna be growing lots of container stuff this year because we have uh, a whole series planned for container gardening. So stay tuned for that, very, very cool. We're basically gonna be turning a 250 square foot patio into a complete uh, container garden with everything that you would need to grow. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be very, very cool. So we got some Rutgers tomatoes for that. Uh, very early maturing beef steak, kind of slicer style tomatoes. San Marzano, got some more paste tomatoes. Marglobe, indeterminate slicer tomato, six to eight ounce tomatoes. Beautiful, great for uh, ketchup and canning and uh, fresh eating, things like that. Um, we also have some uh, rose tomato. Grew, this, grew these last year, absolutely fell in love with them. It's a cross between a, uh, a Rutgers tomato and a brandy wine. Absolutely incredible. Just the most beautiful tomato ever. So, so pretty. It's got this just blushy pink color to it. Um, and then trophy tomato. This is a wonderful indeterminate beef steak, right around one to two pounds. Just, you know, trying to get as many big beefy tomatoes as we can this year because it's all about food security, all about food security. And we do find we eat more beef steaks and, and paste tomatoes than we do cherry tomatoes. That's why we only had one cherry tomato variety and it's one of our favorites. Uh, we have a, another onion, Utah yellow, more of the usual. Homestead tomato, um, just another very reliable, all around great producer and uh, very good for canning and paste and all those things because uh, you know the, the goal for this year is food security. Mammoth snow melting peas, uh, more beans, top crop beans, more blue lake bush beans, more blue lake bush beans, uh, some sugar snap peas, Serrano, uh, some Serrano peppers, love these in cooking, absolutely beautiful and so delicious once they're uh, fully ripe. Some golden sweet peas, scarlet kale, or uh, not scarlet kale, lacinato or dinosaur kale. Jalapenos, I cannot go without those, those are essential here in our house, um, especially with uh, how much we love spicy food, absolutely love spicy food, so we, we use a lot of those. Um, Keystone resistant giant peppers, bell peppers, another pack of those. California wonder bell peppers, um, just your typical blocky bell peppers, great producers, super disease resistant. They do wonderful for us and um, usually some of our best producers in the garden in terms of peppers. Autumn bell red peppers, cannot go wrong with those. We also have, um, saving some interesting things uh, for last here. Also have some more lettuce, some red sails, some red sails leaf lettuce, butter crunch, uh, bib lettuce. All these will be grown for uh, heads or leaves. We're really just growing them for food, so I don't really care at this point. Um, the stuff we're starting right now will probably be more like a head lettuce than a leaf lettuce, but you can still cut the leaves off and use it for leaf lettuce as well. And last but not least is something that a lot of you guys are gonna have questions on, so that's why I left it for last, and that is the beets. Now, normally we would never start beets inside. However, 
we are going to be starting them in larger containers. That means that we're going to basically be able to transplant the entire root ball without damaging the root system at all. Normally, if you don't, uh, if you don't transplant them correctly or you start them in too small of a container, you can damage the root system and that then damages the root that you're harvesting, which is a beet or a carrot and things like that. So we're not starting carrots like this, but we are starting beets. And that's because they're a little more forgiving. And because we do have a larger container that we're starting them in, um, it's going to give us some time and some forgiveness that we can get them growing, move them out into the garden. And we're going to use a method called multi-sowing. Now, multi-sowing is where you plant two or three seeds in a small cluster and uh, seeds like uh, carrots, um, beets, uh, radishes, they can be multi-sowed. And that's where you sow them in a small cluster and they grow out. They actually will hit each other and push out rather than crowd themselves out. And now too many, they'll still crowd themselves out. But if you start them in like a group of three seeds or two seeds, they're going to hit each other and spread outwards. And so uh, it's a great method that's been used for a long time and it's going to allow us to do that. So essentially each square is going to have three beets growing in them. So in one single square here, we're going to have uh, about uh, 18, 18 beets in a single square. Now we are also going to succession sow and plant more beets directly in the ground. But this again is going to get us started, get our food growing now because we have the lights, we have the space, we have the equipment and uh, and so we don't have the time. <laughs> so uh, time is of the essence. We're gonna start them now. And uh, so stay tuned for next episode where we walk you through uh, how to start these seeds. It's gonna be a ton of fun. Very, very glad you guys decided to stay, uh, stick around for this video. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned something new and uh, we have a ton more content coming out. Now that we are in a lockdown state, can't really go anywhere. And so, um, you know, with the occasional walk around the block or uh, you know trip to the grocery store, um, which is very rare at this point, uh, we're at home. So I have nothing better to do than to be out in the garden, pass the time, and uh, yeah, keep your sanity. So I hope you guys uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll be seeing you a lot more, especially now that the season's starting to warm up. All right, catch you guys on the next episode. As always, this is Luke from the MI Gardener channel, reminding you to grow big or go home. We'll catch you later. See ya. Bye.